Hey everybody, Mr. Kalbeck here, and we're going to be talking about projectile motion today, and we're going to be using parabolas to model it. Uh, it's going to be one of our last sections in this chapter, so it's kind of exciting. Uh, we're almost done with another chapter, totally distance learning, woo! Um, you can see with my super awesome drawing here that when you throw something or launch something or pretty much anything flies through the air that doesn't have an engine attached to it, um, it's going to fly in a parabola. And even if it looks like it's a straight path, um, for example, like if you shoot like a bow and arrow or something, it looks like uh, it's straight but it actually goes in a parabola. Baseballs, even if you throw really, really hard, are going to go in terms of a parabola. Um, so I hope you appreciate my, uh, my lit drawings here. They're pretty great. But we're going to take a look at how the equation of uh, any projectile can be modeled with a, a quadratic equation. I'm going to show you um, what that equation looks like and how to use it. It's going to look a little scary at first, so try not to get too worried about this. Uh, but I think it's going to be a pretty, uh, hopefully, a, a useful lesson for you. Uh, if you get into physics um, later, you're going to learn uh, more complicated versions of this same equation that we're going to factor in things like wind resistance and stuff like that. Uh, we're not going to worry about any of that stuff right now because you need geometry to be able to deal with it. So we're going to assume that wind resistance doesn't really have much of an effect on this stuff. And for most projectiles, it's not a big deal. So you still get a pretty accurate representation. Um, so here's the equation. Again, it's going to look a little scary at first, but try not to be, uh, try not to panic. Uh, it, it is a, it's, it's usable, and I'm going to explain each piece in detail, so you're going to understand where all this stuff comes from. So this equation is going to model pretty much anything going through the air. So we're going to use the function h of t because we're going to be talking about the height of your projectile over time. So time is your variable, like x. Um, and we're going to use h of t to represent y, just so that tells us that we're talking about how high your projectile is over time. We're not talking about distance traveled, but we're talking about how high it is based on your unit of time. And notice I use a cursive t, because otherwise it tends to look like a plus sign. This is a variable v. It's a placeholder for a number. And we use the little subscript 0, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And this is another placeholder h with another subscript of 0. So that looks pretty scary at first, but each thing, uh, again, every equation that we use in math can look scary if you don't know what the things mean. And once you learn what they mean, it's not too bad. Okay. Remember, h of t, this is function notation, so you can think of this as y. But it's a specific y. It's a y that deals with... Uh, how high something is over time. So we use h of t. And h, by the way, is going to be the, the height. This is all in feet. Okay, so we're looking at feet. And time, here we go, h is in feet and t is seconds. So we're looking at specifically feet per second. This right here is a constant. Um, it has to do with how things accelerate, um, and it's actually a really nice number. When you're dealing with feet, it ends up being exactly 16. So this is going to be at 16 times steeper than your uh, parent function of a parabola when we look at it. Uh, and it's also going to be upside down because it's negative, which gives us this um, curving shape that goes down. So as gravity pulls objects, it pulls it with this particular factor of negative 16. So this is a constant. You don't need to worry about that. Again, t is seconds. This is v. We say v sub 0. That's not a reference to a Mortal Kombat character. Um, what it says is this is the, uh, the initial. So when you have the, the number 0 as a subscript, it's not an exponent. You're not multiplying it by 0. It tells me that this is the starting amount. And v stands for velocity. or speed, if you like to think about it that way. So it's the speed of your object, and the zero represents that it's the starting amount. Remember, we start um, our function at zero, usually. You can think of time zero as when y equals zero, you're starting at time zero. Um, you can think of the x-intercepts where y equals zero. So you have all these situations um, where zero is represents a starting point. So that's why we use the the subscript is zero to represent the very beginning of something. So this is not just velocity, but we say it's the initial velocity. Or if you prefer, 
the starting velocity, okay, because it's that zero. And the h sub zero, same thing. You might even guess what this means. Again, it's another initial because it's that zero. Again, the starting amount, things start at zero on our number line. The h represents the height. So this is not just height, but the initial height. So if you're thinking about our situation of a baseball, you might think of the height. The initial height is how high it was when the pitcher released the ball. And the initial velocity is how fast his fastball was. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and we're going to see what this looks like here. Okay. Um, we're going to start with uh, something like this. So let's imagine. Uh, let's... Hold on one second here. So we're going to take a look at, um, you could think about uh, like a firework. So fireworks get launched from the bottom. It's like a big missile, but it doesn't really have an engine to it. So we're going to say that there is a hill over here. And there's a rocket that's launched from the top of the hill. Okay, so the rocket's going to go in a parabolic arc, and it is going to explode, which is pretty great. Um, yay! And then it's going to fall back into uh, fall back to the ground. All right, and here's your equation for this rocket. This is a pretty big, good picture, right? I mean, like. Look at how great this picture is. Wow. Let me get some different colors in here. Yay, cool. All right. Nice. So we're going to say that the hill is 100 feet tall. And we're going to say it has uh, an initial velocity of 80 feet per second. OK? And I want to write an equation for this. Now, a lot of problems like this are actually going to give you the equation, but we're going to actually practice writing one as well. And we're going to see how this all goes together. And then we're going to be able to figure out things like where does it land, uh, what's the maximum height, things like that. All right? So if I want to look at this, I'm going to plug each of these pieces in. H of t doesn't change because that's your y variable. And the negative 16 doesn't change either. That's a constant that has to do with Earth's gravity. Okay, so we're not, I mean, if you're shooting it on the moon, this number is going to change. If you're on Jupiter, the number is going to change. But for Earth, it's going to be negative 16, pretty much no matter where you are. Now I have to deal with this initial velocity. And I have it right here. My initial velocity is 80 feet per second. Again, this is in feet for height, and t is seconds, so I don't have to do any like changing or anything. I just say that the initial velocity is 80 feet per second. And the initial height, this was launched from a hill 100 feet tall. So I'm going to say this is a 100 foot tall hill. And there's my equation. I know this thing looks really scary. we got subscripts and all kinds of crazy variables. But at the end of the day, it's actually pretty easy. So... <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and uh, see what we can figure out from this. I want to I want to know two questions. I want to know the maximum height of this, and I want to know where it lands. I'm going to let you guys press pause and see if you can do that, and uh, we're going to see what you can come up with here. All right. Hopefully you pressed pause and you tried it, and we're going to see what's going on here. So if it were me, I would think about this instead of my diagram, I would probably draw some axes on here. So I'm going to draw that right over the top of this. And you can set your axes wherever you want, but you can see if we draw it like this, that the initial height is the y-intercept, and the place where it lands is the x-intercept. The maximum height where it explodes would be the vertex. So if I want to find a, a handful of things, like where it lands and the maximum height, that means I need to find the x-intercepts, and I need to find 
the maximum height which I would use to find or I would use the line of symmetry and plug that in to find uh, the vertex so let's go ahead and try that again for me I would look at this um, you could probably actually factor this. I didn't check to see if it works, uh, but the numbers are big enough that I'm probably just going to use the quadratic formula. Again, the quadratic formula is a bazooka, and this looks like kind of a scary problem, so I'm just going to deal with it right away. We're going to go ahead and see if we can use the quadratic formula to solve this. So I'm going to go ahead and use another piece of paper here, and we're going to try it. So I have h of t equals negative 16. So here's my equation we just wrote down. It's 80t plus 100. All right. Now, the quadratic formula, remember, is x equals. But instead of x, we have t on this, so it's the same thing. Don't, don't worry about the, the nomenclature here. The x and t can be interchangeable. So we're going to still use the quadratic formula. This is my a. That is my b. That is my C, just like in every quadratic. So let's plug this into my equation. So x equals negative b, so negative 80, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's 80 squared, minus 4, times a, which is negative 16, times c, which is 100, all over 2a negative 16 uh, times 2. All right. As always, we're going to start with the discriminant. The discriminant is the square root part of it, uh, and it's going to tell me whether I have two x-intercepts, one x-intercept, or zero. Uh, remember, um, if it's a positive number, I'm going to have two x-intercepts. And it looked like, based on my diagram, that I'm going to have two x-intercepts I'm probably going to have two here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. And I could type this directly into my calculator and just see what I get. Remember to be really careful about your parentheses and your negatives when you type things into your calculator. Don't just assume stuff. Um, your, your calculator does not know what you mean. It only knows what you type. So be really careful. So minus 4 times. Again, I'm going to use the negative 16. That's the negative at the bottom times 100. Use those parentheses liberally because your calculator, again, does not know uh, what you mean. It only knows exactly what you type. So I have 120 or 12,800. Wow, that's pretty high. Um, and I'm going to be taking the square root of that. So I can hit the square root button. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit second negative sign down here, which is equals, actually. Or sorry, it's the answer. So I'm going to hit second negative, and it gives me the answer. So I'm just going to be taking the square root of 12,800, and I get 113.1. And that's close enough for what we're doing today. The bigger the number, the less important these little decimals become, proportionally speaking. So I now have negative 80 plus or minus all of this all over 2 times negative 16, which is negative 32. Remember, that's two different equations. That's negative 80 plus 113.1 over negative 32, and negative 80 minus 113.1 divided by negative 32. And you could type both of those into your calculator. But remember, as always, if you have more than one thing in a fraction, put it in parentheses. We generally don't write those parentheses when we're doing the math, but your calculator really needs them because it doesn't know where your numerator starts and stops. So uh, I'm going to use my parentheses again. Use them liberally, which means use them a lot. So I'm ending my parentheses there, then hit the division sign, and then we can type in negative 32, which I'll also put in parentheses just to make sure my calculator knows what's going on. So that's negative. One, I just do negative one. That's close enough because again, these numbers are very large. Uh, and we'll do the other one here. And if you want to take a quick shortcut, you can hit second enter. Second enter says entry, and that will type in exactly what you just typed into your calculator. And I can just change it real quick. 
So instead of it being plus 113, it's going to be minus 113. And we can hit enter, and this one gives me about 6. All right, and remember, what that tells me, that's T, right? That was T equals or X equals. So this tells me since T is in seconds that my rocket landed either at negative one seconds or six seconds. What? Negative seconds? What the heck does that mean? Let's look at our graph here. Uh, remember our X variable or T is time. So that's the X axis. And the y-axis is height. So if I'm looking at negative, what I'm really looking at, a negative time represents this point over here, which doesn't really make sense in the context of our problem since it was launched from a hill. It didn't like go backwards in time and burrow through the hill to get to sea level, right? That doesn't really make sense. So I can ignore this one. Negative time um, represents something that happened before my situation started. Uh, and, and in this particular problem, it doesn't really make any sense. But this one right here tells me this is six seconds after it launched. So I know that it, it landed six seconds after it's launched. Again, I don't have to consider the negative case. That doesn't just, it just doesn't make sense. Whenever you get a problem in math and you get an answer, you should always ask yourself this question. Does this make sense? If your answer doesn't make sense, you should reject it. Okay, um, so that gives me six seconds. The other thing that I need to figure out is the height. And the height, uh, the, the maximum height is going to be the place of the vertex. So all I need to do is the same exact thing that we did before finding the vertex. We're just going to be finding that vertex um, of a different equation. I'm going to find the vertex of this equation. And again, remember, line of symmetry formula, negative b over 2a, the first part of that quadratic formula. So I'm just going to plug that in. B is 80, so it's negative 80 over 2A, which was negative 32. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and type that in my calculator. It's going to be a decimal, and that's okay. And you get 2.5. So my, my maximum height happens when T, again, remember T is what's going on here. We don't, we're not looking at X, looking at T. It's going to happen at 2.5 seconds. Looks like my graph isn't perfect here. I know that's a surprise to everyone. Remember, the, the vertex is going to have a coordinate. It's going to have a x and a y coordinate, or a t and an h coordinate in this case. So I know that the x is 2.5. I just got to figure out what the y is. And I do that by plugging it into the equation. So I'm going to plug this in for t. I'm going to be finding h of 2.5. That's what I'm looking for. And uh, again, you can type this into your calculator as well. I think you should hopefully not have too much trouble with it. But again, use those calculators. Be careful with your parentheses. Make sure you put everything that you can in parentheses. Because your calculator does not know what you mean. only knows what you, what you say. So this gives me a height of 200. when I plug that in. So that means that this, uh, this uh, firework had a maximum height of 200 feet, which took place after two seconds. So I might write something like this. My max height was 200 feet after 2.5 seconds. And uh, that's how you use this. I'm not going to do a lot more of these. Um, I think they're useful. A couple of quick things to note. If you're launching something from the ground or sea level, your H value is going to be zero. So a lot of times you're just not going to write it in. Um, so be careful with that. You can also rearrange the equations um, in any way that you like. So a lot of times you're going to see something like, you know, this will be the second term. But it still represents the same numbers. So be careful with that. So h of 0 is going to be that. OK, next thing. Um, if uh, you would like help on this and you are getting stuck on anything, um, there is a secret word which is going to allow me to know if you watched this or not. 
um, given the average viewership is now declined to 20% of my class, um, despite the note requirement. So I'm not really sure how you guys are writing down the notes, given that you aren't watching the videos. But this is going to guarantee it. If you do need help, you got to tell me the magic word. Um, and the magic word for this week is hippopotamus, or this lesson is hippopotamus. So if you want help, all you need to do is write in the subject line of your email, hippopotamus, and I will know that you actually watched it, and I'll be happy to help you. I might even make a bonus video for you. Um, so anyways, uh, life's good. Hope things are well with you guys, and we'll talk soon.